Okay, it is five o'clock, so I'm going to call our meeting to order. And I will begin with Laura Lee calling the roll, please. Stu Boyd. Denise Chapman. Here. Amy Doran. Here. Don Kirk. Here. Barbara Cruz. Here. Alexandra Lessam. Here. Nancy Rumpel. Here. Thank you, Laura Lee. And Nancy, would you lead us in the pledge? It's right over there. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Nancy. All right, we'll begin with the ado uh, adoption of the agenda for today. And I have on my paper October, actually November 6th today, <laughs> not um, October. So I, are, are there any changes to the tonight's meeting agenda? Hearing none, I will take a motion to adopt the agenda as printed. So moved. So Don. Second. And Amy. Thank you. Laurelie, would you please call the roll? Stu Boyd. Denise Chapman. Aye. Amy Doran. Aye. Um, Don Kirk. Aye. Barbara Cruz. Aye. Alexander Lesson. Aye. Nancy Rumpel. Aye. And the motion passes. And we'll begin with our school presentation by Mountain View High School. Madam President, members of the board, and Dr. Schaefer, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we're glad to have you here with us. Um, and I would like to introduce tonight um, our junior ROTC cadets, as well as their instructor. <laughs> They're on the way. Are we too early? Nope, that's okay. Um, they don't talk. How's it going? <laughs> so, um, we have three JROTC instructors that work with our students both here and at Berkman High School. Um, and with us tonight is Lieutenant Colonel Willie Jones, mm -hmm. our primary instructor. Um, and then presenting tonight, we have two of our cadets, Cadet Captain Amelia Gallatin and Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Jacob Coleman. I had to use a cheat sheet because I want to make sure I got their rank and everything correct mm -hmm. tonight. Um, but they would like to talk to you a little bit about what the program looks like here at Mountain View um, and some of the awards and kind of an opportunity to tell you everything that they do within that program and the experience that they've had so far. So I'm going to turn it over to both of you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, like we said just now, I am Cadet Captain Amelia Gallatin, and I'm the Special Projects Officer for our battalion. This is Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Jacob Coleman. He's our battalion commander right now. Um, we just wanted to say thank you for showing your support for our battalion and letting us work here and present tonight. Um, we are the Fifth Brigade Mountain Lion Battalion. We are based in Mountain View High School, but we have cadets participating from Bertha, Thompson Valley, and Wells Ridge. Our mission statement is to motivate young people to become better citizens and leadership is the success of this life. Our structure, the Army Jersey Sea Program is operating in around 17,000, or sorry, 1,700 public and private institutions around the nation. We have about 240,000 cadets in the entire nation. We are a four-year program that is organized into leadership, education, and training levels, or LET levels, that teach us valuable skills and life, life skills. Do you need to grant core credits for ours? Um, we do a fitness credit and also a civics credit, which we both need to graduate. It's just something that we entice them with to join the program and get them to stay here. Uh, we have 133 cadets total in our program right now, separated across the LET levels and this slide. We currently have five operating co-curricular activities. We have Raiders, which is our competitive athletic program, our drill and color guard team, which is our precision marching unit. We compete at national competitions. We have our marksmanship class, which is teaching air rifle, shooting, and um, safety. We have our Junior Cadet Leadership Challenge, which is a summer camp that we attend each summer to learn leadership and Army training skills. And we have our Leadership and Academic Bowl, which is a Leadership and Academic National Competition. Currently, we are in our Level 1 training for that. We have 
two extracurriculars that we are hoping to offer in the future. The first one is drones, mm -hmm. which is a student-centered drone piloting course. We have the optical course set up. We are waiting for guidance from the Army to provide us with drones. And then our second extracurricular we're hoping to add is archery, which is teaching safety with a bow and arrow and then self-discipline leadership skills and a bunch of other things. We have all of our supplies. We're just waiting from, um, some support from the district for that slide. So our program engagements. Our goal is to promote good citizenship and a sense of civic duty within our schools and our communities, which aligns with this Drive 2025 TSD mission. Um, this year we have executed over 40 engagements, which includes color guards supporting our schools and our communities, and we march in parades either leading with a color guard or like next week in the Veterans Day Parade, we will take almost all of our cadets to march to show our support. Um, in the future, we will be having our military ball, and Cadet Coleman will now pass out the say the dates and a letter regarding that event. Slide. These are just some photos from our battalion in the last year. <coughs> this picture in the top left is of our unit at the Drill and Color Nationals at the Denver Coliseum last April. These two photos are from our first Raider and Color Guard competition, where our Raider team placed first and our Color Guard team placed third. This photo is from our award ceremony last May. It was a special session to recognize the hard work that our seniors had put into the program. This photo is from our Vet One Basic Training where we acquaint the new cadets in our program to what it's like to be together in a unit and also to issue them all of their uniforms. This photo and this photo are from our um, summer camp. This is of the One Rope Bridge Vet, which simulates crossing a danger zone, like a river or uh, a ravine or something. And this photo is of one of our cadets repelling down a step. This photo is from Thompson Valley's homecoming football game. We provided a super guard to help announce the homecoming royal flag. These three photos of our, this center one is a receiving line from our military ball. It's just something we do to welcome the guests and to introduce everybody. We'll have one at our upcoming military ball in March. This photo is of our entire unit from Drill and Color Guard Nashville last year. And this photo is four of our cadets at our award ceremony receiving the Sons of the American Revolution Award, which is a national level award provided by um, the American Legion in our community. Slide. Um, this concludes our brief. Um, the floor is now open for any questions. <laughs> so board members, do you have questions? I just one before we start. You said there are 133 in your in our battalion, yes. Yeah, so does that mean they all come over here and meet, or do they meet at their other school? Right now, we have our A company, which is just Mountain View Cadets in periods four and eight. We have our B company at Loveland High School, which is periods one and three, which is just um, Loveland Cadets. And then we have our C company, which is Thompson Valley and Berthoud. Right now, Thompson Valley is busing over to Berthoud for their class period. And next year, we are going to be busing Thompson Valley to Berthoud and Loveland to Mountain View. Oh, nice. This is curious because that was a lot of kids. They were all coming over here at the same time. Okay, that was my big question. But how about over here? Don? Question? Okay, we'll come back. I know you're eating. <laughs> Barb touched on my question. I was wondering the logistics about how you all. Yeah. I'm what? curious from each of you on what year you are. Mm -hmm and what you have found to be most valuable personally to you about the program? Um, so I am in my third year in the program. I'm a junior. Um, I joined the program because I've known since I was six that I wanted to carry on my family's legacy to be in, in the Air Force, and this has just given me some of the leg up that I need to hopefully get into one of the service academies. Um, I'm a senior, and this is also my third year. Enlisting in the military, 
military right after high school, if you go through um, a certain number of years in a program, you can get start at a higher level mm -hmm. and a higher pay grade. Thank you. So can you join any of the four years? Is like there a set cut off um, when you wouldn't make sense to join? Well, we have our let ones who start as freshmen, which is what we like to have them do for just so they can get all four years of training. But in the past few years, we've had cadets who have started their freshman year, their sophomore year, their junior, and their even their senior year. Mm -hmm. A couple years ago, we had a cadet who joined her last year in high school, so she could help help to get into the police academy. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, I think it's a great program, and I like the idea that you could come in at a higher pay rate. I, I went in and started E1, so E1 mm -hmm. is like as low as you can go. Mm -hmm. um, but I was curious on a couple things. One, you said you were waiting for district support for the archery. Is, <coughs> what, are you, what, what is the support of that? Uh, we are just waiting for some support on like safety classes that our instructors could take. Um, and Lieutenant Colonel could talk about I that. I can fill up again. So we've um, requested that <coughs> built in as a class, and we're working with the <coughs> team and uh, Principal Ramirez to get that uh, mm -hmm. codified into a course. The instructor and we, uh, the, uh, myself and the two other instructors, have to go through a safety course offered by Bureau of Land Management. So once the, we get blessed off from having that as a, as a class, we will get that safety course and, and be able to deliver that as a, as a 0.5 mm -hmm. election credit. Great. Um, and then I know that you're Sounds like you're going to go Overall, do you know how many um, students after they go through ROTC actually do the work? Um, we, like our program is not recruiting for the military, right. but it's definitely something that kids think about a lot. I think every year we have anywhere from 10 to 15 cadets who go straight into the military and others who go on into college into an ROTC program. It's, it's about 75%. About 75%. But uh, our mission statement is to to motivate young people to be better citizens. Right. So if they go to the military, great. If they go on to, to be a self-sustaining adult, even better. Right? <laughs> yeah. They're not in somebody's basement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah. No, I, I forgot. Do you, Matthew, I'm Thank sorry. you. Do you work with the our, the local ROTC? Um, um, we get support from CSU, and then when we go up to Wyoming, we get support from. University of Wyoming up there too. Ward maybe, can one of you share um, that's big number two right now in the nation for um, funding possibly? Certainly. Uh, so with the district support, we've applied for a second program. Right now the only program that exists is the Mountain View program, and we've extended that out to all four high schools. Uh, the uh, Bertha program has been, uh, application has been accepted. They're number two in the nation right now, nationally, for a program. So we're working with our U.S. Army Cadet Command on when the timing of that funding will come down uh, because the program is about, do, uh, the instructor salary is about half funded by the by the military, and then we get somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars of equipment that goes along with it. So pretty significant, uh, you know, reimbursement and, and funding for the military. Plus about ten to fifteen thousand dollars annually in operating funds, so it helps us run the program. So number two in the nation, we're hoping they're on the list for uh, school year 26-27 funding right this second, but we're trying to get that rolled back to next year. Great. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Really well. Yeah. 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 Sure.
moving to our discussion items. Um, very short one, basically. Um, we do typically what we do, and for those of you that don't know, these, this is our opportunity to have um, a preview of items that we'll be talking about at our next board meeting. And um, our presenters are there and ready, so I'm going to turn it over to you guys and let you get going on where we are. So, um, Kelly Sane, Chief Te Technology Officer. I'm here on behalf of Dr. Melissa Schneider, who is not able to be here, to introduce this amazing team who is going to talk to us about Curriculum Improvement Council. So we have um, Leo Robeson, um, Tiffany Jones, and Andy Stevens. Great. I'm Madam President, Dr. Schaefer, members of the board, Tiffany Jones, Director of Curriculum and Learning, and I've got Andy Stevens, who is our Career and College Readiness Director. We are here to do our annual update for our Curriculum Improvement new course proposals. So as you see here, we've got our Stripe 2025 connection. And we wanted to give you a little preview about our approval process. So in the um, late summer, beginning of August, we put out our CIC uh, Google form. We asked teachers to fill out our form based on any course that they want um, us to consider and, and be reviewed by our team. So our curriculum and learning team reviews those submissions. We want to make sure that they were they fill out the form and they've got all of the required information giving us you know standards what connections they have who would be teaching the course etc um, we make sure that we include if they've got any fees associated with that new course because obviously you all would have to consider that as well um, in really making sure that we've looked at that course through the end the lens of ELD ESS gifted etc to make sure that it's really an appropriate course for all students so when we take that into consideration, we have our CIC meeting and we invite teachers. We obviously invited our board president, who's our committee member. We have our TEA president that's invited. Um, Mr. Robeson's invited. And then, of course, we've got um, a wide variety of our teams that are represented in that group as well. Then we review all of the courses that have been proposed. And then we want to discuss each of our courses. So I have here listed our CIC team. <coughs> and you'll see we've got several teachers on there. We also want to make sure that they are represented. That's OK. And so when we think about our role, our role is really not to always be the gatekeepers and say no. Our role is to really question the why behind submitting a new course. We have a ton of courses that have already been approved. Um, but when we think about our role, we really want to not always bring our judgment and our bias. We want to ask really thoughtful questions, thinking about what are the benefits for approving a course, what might be potential issues if the course is approved, such as a fee again, do we have curriculum, do we even have resources, um, is this something kids do want and they've got a big interest in. Um, and then we think about what that domino effect is. When we think about some of the courses that we're going to go through in a moment, if we approve one PE course, for an example, that's pulling kids away from another course. And so we want to be thoughtful about if a course is approved or suggested to you all, what would that domino effect be so we can play that out and make sure that we're not doing something that would take away from a different program. We also are very thoughtful around is this course being based on a unicorn teacher and we call it a unicorn teacher because it's really around that specific training and that background that maybe again if it's for one person and that teacher <coughs> happens to retire or leave what are we going to do with kids that have an interest can we hire for that and again is it only based on one person that really has the capabilities of doing that course so again these uh, committee members are going through this process and really just having discussion around kind of the pros and the cons and the good, the bad, the ugly of all of the classes. So as we look at the next slide, these are all courses that have been submitted. <coughs> so when we think about this list right here, CTE obviously has a few. Um, so Applied Ag is listed, it would be at grades 10, 11, and 12. They would receive a one credit career pathway and there would be a fee associated with that. Our team did suggest that we would approve that course, um, and that's an exciting course through Andy's department that would be over at Thompson Valley High School. We also know that with our TCC um, EMT pathway that we want to make sure that we looked at the courses that we are submitting for that pathway. We also agreed that that would be approved as a committee. 
Um, and it's great that ROTC was here tonight because they did a, they did request an archery course that would be for our LET kids in LET 1, 2, 3, and 4 um, for all of the students and they would receive a .5 credit of elective in PE. And I'm gonna get into in just a moment why that one was denied or why some specific courses have been denied. That one, the committee decided it was denied and that actually, the archery course is becoming quite popular in Colorado. There are some very specific stipulations um, that it has to be taught by a, a certified CDE teacher. At this time when these were submitted, actually our two teachers, um, one of them just submitted his license now that he's gonna be acknowledged by the state as a licensed teacher. Um, but we're gonna come back to archery specifically because at this time again, we denied it based on we didn't have the information we needed to again follow the course um, piece of being required to have a license by CDE. When we think about cultural anthropology, once we started diving into this one, one of our Ferguson High School teachers submitted this. We actually have a course that's already approved that is meeting the need that she is wanting. Um, and so we denied that based on, we already have a course that was submitted. So again, there are some reasons why courses are submitted, especially if we already have one that is similar for the purpose that she was looking for that already exists. We had officiating that was submitted um, by Loveland High and then of course another high school said, I'd love to submit that as well. Part of it is we do know that we are in a shortage for offici officials at all of our sporting events. And if we can provide that opportunity where high schoolers then are getting that experience and we are doing our own training, maybe we can reap those benefits and support some of our athletics. Um, with our own students. And so that was a really great conversation and that would earn that .5 PE credit. There would be associated cost with that and that's based on um, kind of that certificate that students would earn when they complete that course. The team and committee did approve that one. Our online media one course was submitted and we asked a bunch of questions around this one. If we already have a course similar, did this go through obviously the entire process of making sure the, the principal <coughs> approves it, the department has good conversation. At this time that one is denied because we're still looking for more information on that course. Unified art and unified courses are actually coming up quite a bit. Um, Laszlo Hunt, our director of uh, exceptional student services and I have really done a lot of thinking about what are these courses and what do they look like. We know that um, Unified Music, Unified Art, Unified PE have all been big requests and so what we're doing right now with our Unified courses, um, and you'll see that this one was denied, is we're really doing um, a deep dive into figuring out, again, what is the purpose and is this the best practice for our Unified um, you know, programs. When we had discussion around this one specifically, in a, in a later slide I'll talk to you a little bit more, we had a lot of conversation, is this about inclusive practice or are we now creating some exclusive courses? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is where our team really said, we're gonna deny this one based on the information we have currently. And then that allows Laszlo and I really to take some time and we've actually seen all of our positive PE courses in our district right now to to see is this really the best way to um, support students right now. So the team and committee did decide to deny that one as well. So we wanted to put in front of you the continuation of courses. We know last year at this time we were looking at our DLI continuation and so what we've done as a committee is DLI um, that AP Spanish 5 is already approved but what we're doing is adding the DLI component. It is something that our DLI students really do want on their transcript, saying that I've been in this pathway for 10 years, I want that course code very specific for DLI. So that would be a continuation of the program we already currently have. Um, IB over at Loveland High, those already come with curriculum and so when we think about CIC's role, it really is to look through that curriculum lens, that staffing piece, um, and that progression. What we've done in the past is IB courses automatically get approved, but of course we wanted to put those in front of you as well. We do have a new career pathway that is starting at um, Loveland High School and they have submitted two courses to be part of that career pathway. And we're super excited to see what that looks like for the 11th and 12th graders. 
And then um, Mountain View High School has requested that, again, we already have a, a chemistry course, but they really want it specific for Lisa. And so again, we already have the course, the curriculum's already designed, they just wanna add their <coughs> Lisa um, components to it. And so again, that one was just a continuation and that would be offered here. So these are basically approved, just continuation of what we have yes. going deeper with them. Yep. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So our next steps, one, we really wanna follow up with JROTC. I know we've had about four <coughs> meetings with them to hear what are their real needs. They know that right now their attrition rate as kids go through let one, let two, let three, let four, as their um, diagram has shown, they're losing kids. And when they talk to the kids about why are you not continuing on, part of our kids really have given feedback of because I'm not getting graduation credit. I've got to take other credits that are going to help me graduate. So then what we're seeing is that attrition go down as their juniors and seniors. So what we requested is to meet with the two gentlemen that now um, are really bought into this program of what are the real needs and then what we can do, because they already designed their own curriculum, we can crosswalk standards with their curriculum and see where does that make sense. And so instead of trying to submit courses you know, that are individual like an archery for a full semester, let's look at the entire four years of curriculum and then start to see where we could pair in you know, maybe a .5 language arts, a .5 um, PE, which we already do. We already do the .5 civics. But how do we look at the four-year continuum instead of just the individual pieces um, to support the students and the teachers? And so that's why part of the reason we denied it is let's do a deeper dive in really figuring out what does the four-year progression look like instead of just trying to kind of put the Band-Aid on. We also know that we want to review that process and procedure for what a pathway looks like and then making sure that we continue to review and discuss the way we do unified courses. Again, we're really um, aware of our, our students in making sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. And again, when we think about some of our unified and adaptive PE, teachers hear that that's such a great opportunity to do adaptive PE, and that's written into an IEP. And so then they say, great, but we wanna do a unified music so kids you know, have this opportunity. And we wanna be very just aware of then are we creating exclusive practices or are we really doing inclusive practices? So Lasso and I have um, had a few meetings about that as well, but certainly wanted to let you know why we're taking our time on that, just so that we're not putting courses out there that again, um, aren't supporting all students. What questions do you have for us? I let you talk a lot. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> All right, questions. Let's start with Nancy. Well, actually, you answered all of my questions yeah. during your presentation, Great. so thank you. No, thank you. It, it was good to hear the explanation behind the courses, and I definitely like the idea of looking sort of at the broader the broader picture rather than just throwing courses in here and there. So I appreciate the work that you're doing for that. Absolutely. Amy? The questions that I had earlier, you answered as the, you know, as the presentation went on. So thank you for just being so thorough. Absolutely. Yeah. And Don? I have some. Sorry. <laughs> Great. We almost had a, we almost had a sweep. But, um, so, I, when, um, thank you for talking about the Unified. And it just strikes me that as you're doing that work, this is one of those opportunities where it's really more like a continuum probably when we actually get in digging into it, right? Because there are probably plenty of classes where it just makes sense to make it inclusive and it might need to just be put into that. So um, that was kind of one thought I had around trying to do that. And then I wondered, you, I know you said that you really try to have it be more of a like, have you thought of these things? And so I wondered about that in the process with some of what you were talking about for the denials, like how does, how does that go on as somebody hears that it goes oh well if they really have a class like that already but I don't have it what do we what do they do like what would that look like so we communicate so then that night we meet um, and decide everything and then that following day I've got um, two people on our team that email the teachers right away including their principals to say here's the information of whether we're suggesting it for the board mm -hmm. um, or it's denied based on these reasons so we communicate that and then the teachers like oh great that already I'd already reached out prior to say, are you sure that you 
you are asking for this specific piece, because we already have a course that is actually titled this, it comes with this. So sure. we okay. communicate with actually all of those teachers, um, especially if they're denied, to, to make sure that they understand why as well. Awesome, that's perfect. And then I wondered why the IB classes get approved automatically. So they come with curriculum, and okay. historically the IB ones have. Um, in past years, they get their own course code already. Um, because and we have the people to teach it? We do. In every case? <coughs> Okay. There. Right. Yep. Okay. That, oh, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Cool. The CP is just the career pathway is just a new pathway, and so they're trying to put some um, pieces there that will support that pathway and gain some students in there. They're really excited about it, and it's going to be great. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh. Nice job. Yeah, see you. Yeah, nice job <laughs> checking out our presentation. Uh, Andy, okay. while you're here, uh -huh. um, I would love for you to. <laughs> Uh, high level, maybe share a little bit about that EMT pathway, yeah. as well as maybe your partnership with uh, Love of Fire. Yeah, so uh, as just a, a friendly reminder for the board, uh, we were given $2 million from uh, Bohemian Foundation and Larimer County, and we have been in the process of building a 2,200 square foot expansion at the Thompson Career Campus, uh, that th that $2 million will be used to provide the physical infrastructure in new instructional space to launch our first public safety pathway. With the stairs, right? Uh, yeah, it is going to have kind of like a uh, riser style seating, hopefully. Uh, knock on the nearest piece of wood, but um, right now that's in the budget. Hopefully it stays that way. Um, and it is a two year pathway. And essentially what students will be able to do is uh, by the end of that two years, they will be prepared to sit for the national registry exam for EMT. And essentially, as long as they are 18 years of age and have passed that exam, they are able to then be hired as an EMT in our community. Um, in addition to that, as all of our CTE pathways in the district do, there will be concurrent enrollment offered for students, there will be core credit offered for students, and then obviously the elective credit as well. Um, we're partnering with Thompson Valley EMS uh, and they are all in and it is a beautiful partnership. Um, they are helping with instructional staff. They are helping with the clinical hours that are required by the state for our students to become licensed. Um, and I, I can tell you without their partnership, this program would have never gotten off the ground. So we are extremely thankful to their partnership and collaboration. Um, and as I mentioned, this is really just step one of a broader vision around offering public safety pathways in EMT, fire science, and law enforcement. Um, and, and so, say that again. And dispatch. There you go. Got it. Yeah, For dispatch. sure. So um, working in partnership with our public agencies to kind of give them first right of refusal around this is your training ground. And just like in education, they've got employment shortages as well. And so really being able to use our career pathway programs as an opportunity for them to really train the next generation of staff for their agencies. Um, we're partnering with Ames Community College for post-secondary credit. And the beauty of the way that we've been able to design the two-year pathway in partnership with TIFF and her team is if a student decides after year one that you know they're a senior and they're ready to graduate, they can do an ascent year and, and vertically it's already aligned with Ames. And so they just go right over to Ames and Windsor <coughs> to the Public Safety Institute and they will automatically just be sliding right in to the year two cohort. Um, so it's, it's a beautiful model that allows some flexibility for students, especially as we launch we didn't want to tell seniors like, well, sorry, you know, you're penalized because of your age. Um, we wanted to create a way that we could still welcome seniors, give them the launch pad to then be able to move forward and still pursue that ultimate certification. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? All right, that's item 4.1. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Yes. Thank you. 4.2 is just our standard action items, approval of personnel, extra duty, extra duty contracts, contracts greater than 
thousand, any donations, any of those kinds of things. And so there will be more items on the agenda that fall under this uh, group. All right. Um, Stu isn't here, so we don't have a CASB update. So we'll be moving right on into our study session discussion, and we're going to turn it right over to Kelly. <laughs> you want to so sit back Kelly? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Schaefer, Madam President, and board members, Kelly Singh, Chief Technology Officer. So I'm here to talk a little bit about our study session and learning how to use technology in TSD. So um, the purpose for us um, is to make sure that we're empowering you know, our community to grow and using the future um, innovative technology today. You know, when you think about making sure that we're preparing our kids to be digitally connected, so the one constant that we always have is technology is going to change constantly. So how do we make sure that we expose our students to um, tools that create environments for them to be comfortable with change? That's one of the biggest pieces. So here's our Strive 2025 connection. You know, again, we're using the digital tools of their future. We want to make sure that our kids reach their highest potential. So when you think of AI, and digital creation. Those are some of the things that you'll learn about today in our study session. Um, those are just some of the tools that we have and our amazing, amazing teacher staff is here along with students. Um, so if you think of our students right now who are kindergartners in 2024, they're gonna graduate in 2036. So just imagine <laughs> what kind of technology they're gonna have available for them by then. I mean, I didn't see you know, the iPad coming I didn't see, um, so don't fire me that I didn't see any of these things. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and when you think about, you know, AI and how fast it has grown, um, those are things that you can't anticipate. So we have to make sure our students and our teachers are comfortable. So you will talk about AI today, about robotics, and of course, computer science and digital citizenship. So those are some things that you'll talk about today. So um, we can't make any of this work without our. Um, you can go back one more time without our w working group. So, thank you. So, um, we have our digital learning cohort, so we're in year two with that. So, our first year we um, worked with, you know, kindergarten, um, second, sixth, and ninth grade. And so now we are working with first, third, um, seventh, and um, tenth grade. And it just takes that village to be able to do all these different things with technology. So we do have a technology advisory and leadership council. We have started an AI task force this year. And then of course we do digital citizenship with our amazing digital media literacy team and our tech facilitators and our digital teacher librarians. So imagine that, Kelly's bringing in people and we're gonna have a station rotation. <laughs> so um, we are gonna get hands-on learning from our different individuals here. So our first piece will be in this room, and this is with our digital learning cohort members. And we have an elementary focus. We are using a tool called Adobe Express. So um, Jessica is here from Garfield, and so she's gonna talk to us about what our students created. And Dave Delwart is gonna be there with them. So Dave is one of our inter implementation specialists, and he has been instrumental in teaching and working with our digital learning cohort members. Then we are going to go to station two, and if you guys want to raise your hand. <laughs> so we've got Deanna and um, Brady over here who are going to talk to us about digital citizenship. So they are from Lorraine Edmondson, and they um, have done some really great ideas to make sure that our kids understand how to be responsible digital citizens in some of the conversations that they're having. And then we'll meet here in station three, which is our AI task force. So we're going to talk with Aaron, and I think he is here. Yep. <laughs> Aaron Estevez, and he is um, coming to us with some awesome suggestions about how he's been using AI with some of his students. And then I'd, I would be remiss to not um, introduce the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. So Sheena Kelly is our um, coordinator of digital media literacies. She works with all of our teacher librarians as well as our tech facilitators, and it has been an amazing team member for us. And then Ann Dewey is new. She's our manager of ed tech and digital media with all the different programs and things that we're working on to really try and create 
um, environments where kids are using technology as tools, she's been essential. And then Roger Torres, who is another one of our um, implementation specialists. So this is what we put together as stations. And I know that some of you, some of you might need to leave. So station one will be these individuals. So as we keep on moving forward, and again, station one, I believe was over here, station two was over here, and station three is here. <coughs> so we kind of started a little bit late, no big deal. We are going to rotate, so if you don't mind moving one more time, we are going to have 10 minutes. So um, I did want to talk a little bit about the three different levels. This was intentional on our part. So we're talking a little bit about the classroom level, which is something that we work on through our digital learning cohort. So that will be in station one where our students are using digital tools at a classroom level. And then we also have school level through our digital citizenship because these individuals work with all kids at the entire school level. And then of course we'll talk about our AI task force that we're trying to work with at a district level. So we're attacking and working in partnership with all three. All right, so I will be timekeeper, official timekeeper. So we're gonna start at 540. And so if you guys don't mind moving to your station and we will go from there. <coughs> and there's desserts. So from, um, you know, again, it takes a village to be able to work with technology. So we wanted to show you three different examples from a classroom level to a building level to a district level. And just know that all these individuals are talking and working together to really provide the best opportunities for our students using digital tools. As you can see, they're excited about it. Yeah. So <laughs> it's really great. one of the challenges that we do have is um, we have inconsistencies. So with our um, FTE, you know, we do have some tech facilitators and we do have implementation specialists and digital media um, librarians, but it's not consistent across the entire um, district. So some are classified, some are certified teachers, so we do have a challenge. Mm -hmm. We also have inconsistencies with the type of technology that yep. they have access to. So we have been fortunate enough to be able to um, provide some devices and software you know, at a district level, but Rotary has been one of the people that we've worked with a lot, and then PTAs. So that is definitely a challenge for us. Um, as a result of some of those pieces, kids get different experiences when it comes to using digital tools. Um, we have done taking devices home for the summer. That was one of the things that we piloted it through six through 12. So that ha happened with lots of success. And then we did pilot at the elementary level, um, at two different schools at the elementary level. And it was really exciting for our students to still be able to use these digital tools during the summer. Some of the things that we didn't talk about was like reading a book with Sora. Uh, all those different kinds of things that kids can do all summer long. So that has been um, a nice piece for equity for us. And then I'll just say that technology changes so quickly. So everyone's comfort level with change is a definitely a challenge. You heard about it today. Some people embrace this idea and embrace the digital tools and others are a little bit nervous about what this really means. And so with all the things that are on our um, teacher's plates and our school's plates, to try and add an additional piece with technology sometimes can be a challenge, but it's also important that our students have these opportunities so that they can be marketable in today's world. So with that in place, do you have any questions for us? I just thought the Adobe Express, how much time that could save me looking for pictures. I could just tell it. Oh, you mean purple in there? Yeah. 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 I mean, and, I, well. <laughs> and I also found it at that station fascinating about how uh, was it Brad? What was his name? Brad? Brady. Brady um, uses Minecraft to think, to learn about how the kids really are, like how they behave online in the Minecraft versus how they are in person. I thought that was really. We are fortunate to have um, strong, you know, digital teacher librarians and tech facilitators at our elementary level. But again, it's not consistent across. Mm -hmm. And I would say, um, you know, I thought her lesson uh, about, you know, we don't, it's not like we don't like our robot just because someone posts something differently, you know, trying to think about it so that hopefully we can raise those, those students who learn up how to be kind to each other in, in an online world. I was impressed with what um, Aaron. Aaron, Aaron 
caring about AI. And I was thinking, as he was talking, about the writing assessment that we were asking and that teachers were kind of up in arms over um, at the class, at the license um, listening session. Listening session. Mm -hmm. And that was the piece, is that they were being asked to do a writing assessment. And I thought, the value of that kind of an, a writing assessment where the kids could learn through e AI how to enhance their own writing would be way more powerful than giving them another <coughs> prompt that they have no interest in writing about. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I, I was very impressed with what he had gleaned at the conference he went to about it. And you know, we sent a, uh, quite a few people to SD this summer, you know, and so the um, AI was the biggest component and, and lots of people did learn a lot about it. I would say that um, not everyone's ready to embrace at the same level. Yeah. Um, so we do have to meet people where they are. Uh, and I would also say that that excitement to be able to have a kid work really detailed on something that's personal to them mm -hmm. is is pretty amazing. Yeah, it, I, everything you just said, I, I I hear that, and then I also think about how um, what Aaron showed us in just a couple minutes with differentiation and the replants, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like giving the the grace for how hard that can be. I can 100% say for everybody everywhere though, that you're spending way more time on whatever you're doing manually and probably with less fidelity because it doesn't, you don't have all this, all of that built in. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I think that trying it and learning it and then seeing what kind of time you get back, even if you never touch it again, except for to do those two things. Yeah. Um, because that right there is access. And, and even if we're not comfortable with it, we're keeping kids from being able to access things that, that they would be able to do. And I was especially excited about the fact that there's so much built into it that is them having um, autonomy and the ability to see themselves in the work because they literally created it and whether we adults know it or not kids do and so if we're gatekeepers because we're not comfortable then we're just going to become further behind from them and, and more unsafe because we don't know how they're using it um, versus like I, you know the more you use it the more you can then go okay here's how it can help me and here's also how you might not be using it well think where we are, it was one year ago, <laughs> yeah. this board meeting study session mm -hmm. where we were all going gaga over what AI was and trying to figure out and, and you had all those um, rotations for us and we couldn't believe it, <laughs> you know, and, and now here we are, it's built into his classroom and it's a natural part of that learning process. You know, everyone's comfort level is different. Yes, 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 yes. 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 I, I was, is, and, yeah. and yeah. I've been in his room enough to know yeah. that that's kind of, yeah, I'm yeah. not surprised, but still, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It is pretty amazing, and you know, it was intentional for us to start with adults using it first, so you understand what it of is, course. and then now, you know, through our AI task force, we'll look at what are some guidance, you know, what are some guardrails, what are some potential suggestions for how teachers can use it, how students can use it, and then go down the path of looking at some tools and thinking about which ones we might want to purchase if we go down that path. This was neat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, what, as far as that, like, guidelines and so on and so forth, what is in place right now, if anything? So, um, you know, we don't have um, tools open on our network doesn't mean that they still won't do them at home um, on our network for tools that don't allow from 18 or under. So students can't use them, teachers could. Mm -hmm. um, so that we have to really look at the data privacy policy and any kind of policy for acceptable use for students. So it is something that we look at. Um, I would say that AI is changing so quickly that it's whack-a-mole. So sometimes <laughs> you know about one piece and then like 
two months later you're like, oh, I didn't even know about that tool. You know, and whether or not it's open or available are things that we still try to keep track of. So our guidance will be around academic integrity. And if you look, remember the responsible use policy that we talked about, so one of the things that we've been talking with teachers is, you know, it says in the responsible use policy that you are citing sources. AI is a source, cite it. You know, and so those are some conversations that we need to get to better. We're thinking about doing like a red light, yellow light, green light about things that you can use AI with as an instructor, things that you can use AI with as a, as a leader, things you can use AI with as a teacher, as a student. And so really getting to those conversations will be the hope of this task force. Yeah, because I think, I mean, I think that's important to have that in place and to have a, you know, policies in place addressing that my husband told me about a story he had heard the other day about a kid who used AI to write his paper and was he failed. The, like the, the, the instructor said, you know, you wrote this paper, he failed because he had used AI. And they're, they're suing the school district because the school district didn't have a policy saying you cannot use AI it, to do this project. Oh. And I told, told my husband, I was like, they'll probably win because mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not in there. It doesn't expressly say that you can't. And so I think having, having you know, as much as it is changing and as, you know, that, I mean, having, <coughs> having something in place about what is and is not acceptable is and that's why we really changed it from um, an acceptable use to a responsible use mm -hmm. so that it's more adaptable for yeah. whatever happens. <coughs> so the responsible use says that you will cite your sources right. so you can really have that good conversation about just going to the internet and copying something using AI, you know, have that conversation. Yeah. You know, having been a teacher and knowing the way teachers think, um, it might be helpful to, to say this is an example of, and this is how you can use it, and to, just to get them started thinking about it, because if we turn it loose and just, or we leave it up to them, you might use AI. That probably isn't gonna happen until we give them that baby step, of what it could look like and how it could, could work. And we're so fortunate to have the digital learning cohort yeah. and all of the um, tech facilitators and librarians to talk about this. <laughs> and so that they can be those stewards and conversations um, at their school level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anybody else, questions, comments? Mm -hmm. no. I was thinking with the, with the one, the Edmondson Elementary one, and having those and that you know, digital citizenship in elementary school and stuff like that I think is so cool and so important and that like, I mean my kids aren't that much older, but they didn't mm -hmm. have that. I mean it wasn't, you know, as much of a thing. And so I think it's good to be starting that. She said all she does they do a weekly Friday newsletter. Mm -hmm. All she does is she puts a tip in every Friday, and that's how she was able to help parents understand more and more the little pieces that parents don't have a handle on. Yeah. So. And we are working on getting that on our website and um, different communications for people with Common Sense Media. It is out there already mm -hmm. with Tech for All about some different support pieces that you can do. Um, and then Brain Pop is available for every single K through eight student. It is so good. I love Brain Pop. I'm so glad we brought it back. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you to this amazing team. We appreciate you, thank you. Thank thank you all being here guests. for the night. They are the ones who make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, 6.2 is our bond and special levy. <laughs> you want some more? Okay. Anybody else want second? Maybe. We'll leave it here. All right. Madam President, Dr. Schaefer, members of the board, I am Gordon Jones. I am the Chief Financial Officer for Thompson School District. Um, probably the least amount of notes or preparation <laughs> or any document that I've had in front of me yep. in my tenure in the district. Not even a full sheet of paper. But, um, oh my gosh. <laughs> just, just to provide a, uh, a, a, and I borrowed the, uh, the handout that we had earlier, so I'm recycling 
Um, just to go over um, a few uh, <coughs> items from the election yesterday. Um, we all know what the outcome was, but um, uh, just a few comments on that um, from a, a math perspective, who would have guessed um, from me. But uh, Larimer County, we had about, uh, within Larimer County, we know Larimer County <coughs> comprises over 98% of the district boundaries. Um, we had about uh, 65,000 votes cast. Weld County, there was about uh, 400 votes, votes cast. And in Boulder County, about uh, 80 votes cast. So the MLO issue 5A on the ballot um, was uh, both of the items, the, the MLO, the special levy, and the bond were both at about the same amounts when you combine all those. Uh, the MLO um, had um, <coughs> yes votes of 41.7% versus 58.3%, um, no votes. And the bond, very similar to that, 40.9% um, yes, 59.1% no. So um, similar to what uh, in my tenure in the district, um, uh, I've been part of three elections now, 2016, 2018, and 2024. Um, 2016, it was similar results to this. Um, the, the district team, staff, board um, looked at items, um, evaluated, um, talked about uh, you know what worked, what didn't work, what what was well received, what wasn't well received, what's truly needed, what uh, I won't say truly needed, what if priorities had changed on what might be needed. Um, for any future um, bond and special levy. That work will take place um, as well here. Uh, we don't have anything at this time from a, uh, a survey standpoint or anything after the fact. Um, I think that's more appropriate um, at, at the whatever time in the future should the board, um, whatever board that is, decide to pursue an election in the future. So. Um, not inconsistent with some of the patterns that we saw across the state. Um, just a brief uh, analysis that I did this morning. Um, of the school districts specifically, I looked at just school districts, those that had bond and um, special levy or mill levy overrides. Both of those, there were about 40% of the districts that failed and 60% of the districts that passed their initiatives. So kind of a, a mixed bag, um, a variety of, of issues at uh, play on the various ballots, and we could analyze that um, uh, ad nauseum. Um, and I think it's worth looking at some of those factors and considering what, uh, what future, um, in, in guiding the future decisions on whether to be on the ballot or not with other, other uh, initiatives. So really with those brief comments, um, that's what, uh, what I have for the board, and I'd be glad to address any questions. So I talked with Mark today, I guess, and I said, so, you know, Hooter passed, we knew St. Rain passed, what were they doing that helped it? And he said it had to do with the bonds that were sunsetting, is that the right term? In some cases, and Gordon can explain this, so an example, like St. Rain would be an example of uh, you know, their language is something like, with no increase in yep. taxes, yeah. because what happened is their, their, their current bond they were under was ending, so it was paid off. And so the mm -hmm. voters could have either received, um, you know, kind of, uh, a, a re not really a refund, yeah. but a lesser taxes Deep collected, rich. or they could just continue taxing at the current rate with no increase in taxes. So there were a number of initiatives, I think maybe, you know, St. Brain, maybe Cherry Creek was another one, maybe Denver. I don't remember, I don't have them. Gordon. Yeah, I was just curious about that. I think that was explained very well when, with the, and there were several ballot questions that had that. With mm -hmm. no increase in taxes, mm -hmm. that means not just their last bond issue, but likely their last two or three bond issues that are, are, are have expired, are expiring mm -hmm. this year, or are s scheduled to expire. They, they basically extended those. So uh, as an example, bonds are typically, typically sold over a 10-year, uh, I'm sorry, a 20-year um, repayment mm -hmm. schedule. 
So as those fall off, there's that, that, that obligation is no longer required of the district, so taxes would go down. The mill levy rates would decrease. So by saying without increasing taxes, it is true. There's not an increase in the mill levy rate. It also doesn't say that if this, if there's not a new initiative, taxes would decrease. Um, that's not part of the language, but that's how that, how that language is, is allowable. Um, Thompson School District could get to that, that point. We have the, uh, the second oldest, not the 2018, but the one before that, 2005, refinanced or refunded, they call it, in 2012, will be dropping off in two years. But that, keep in mind, that's a smaller um, overall bond package as well. So to, to reach the level of the ask of $220 million that we had on the ballot this year, we wouldn't be dropping that off in future years. It would still likely require some level of increase in, in taxation. In this case, it was about that three and a half to four mills, and that's a, a very individual um, evaluation of whether that is, is considered material to me as an individual property owner or whether that's something they would choose to um, absorb or adopt. Other districts, you know, you mentioned Cooter, um, went for a, a special levy in $40 million range. Um, you may recall um, earlier this year, there was quite a community conversation around the closure of schools um, or the potential closure of schools mm -hmm. as they were evaluating school size, something that we frequently do here as well. Um, the community provided, uh, some members of the community provided um, strong feedback around um, not wanting you know, to, to be able to maintain their schools. Um, a solution to that, um, the district came forward with the mill now not only for uh, maintaining uh, neighborhood schools I know that was one of the components I think there was four or five others but that was a, a sell to some of the community um, and I'm, I'm, the, you know, I can't get in the minds of voters why they vote for or not vote for one but but I know that Cooter um, used that as one of the planks of the, of the, of the special levy to appeal to their voters I could say that a different way, which is that their community felt a lot of pain, and this was the solution to that pain. Our community hasn't done that, right? Like, it, it, you know, it, unfortunately, we, well, not unfortunately, but we were being proactive before there is pain, and um, in their case, you know, they had a whole year worth of very difficult conversations that were going to be painful for people, and um, this was the solution that would allow that to not happen. We haven't had to have those kind of hard conversations for people to choose between things they care about because the budget cuts. We'll, uh, I mean, we will engage Magellan Strategies um, to, to really assess just uh, unpack um, some of the reasons why we certainly want to engage our community and, and, and um, seek from them information around why, you know, help us understand. Um, and, um, you know, this was a, uh, especially in our area, it was a, it was a long ballot. There, were, there was a lot of um, decisions for voters to make. There were a number of asks made by uh, different entities, the city, the county, the school district. We also recognize that, like all communities, uh, uh, it's economically difficult uh, for families, uh, for community members, for those retirees uh, and, and, and working families, um, you know, that economics also play a factor, uh, especially when it comes to taxation. So um, yes, um, you know, down to your point, schools, the success of schools and the needs of schools are, are certainly very important. And, um, you know, in, in individual households, um, there are different stories and different reasons why. And so um, all of that will, um, you know, will we'll assess, you know, it's just, um, you know, we, 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 will, we will assess. 
So I am just, I mean, I, I know there's not an answer to this right now, but curious about like our most pressing need was the birth and school situation. And so then like, what do we do now? Or I mean, do we go back? Like what, what? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so the growth is here and continuing. Um, we also had in the bond um, a number of um, compliance needs, right. um, light safety needs. Um, you know, we talked about disrepair. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I would say yes, growth in, in, in the Bertha area was absolutely one of the, the key features of the bond. But there were other, you know, safety, um, security. So all of those were other pieces. We'll discuss as a board uh, what options you know exist and what direction the board would like us to go. We want to gather some information first so that the board um, can have um, maybe have more of an informed discussion around this. Um, and again, there's no again 60% passed, 40% did it, and, and there's a you know, every community has you know, different stories and needs. Growth won't go away. So the growth is continuing, um, and you know, at some point, as our schools continue to fill with with families and, and you know, with students going to schools, we, we, we love it. We love having more students in our district, and we'll you know, uh, at some point, there will be a capacity um, squeeze. And, and, and again, there's options available, right? So we we can explore those. Um, one option was to um, add additional capacity at our two elementary schools and our middle school in Bertha, that was, uh, that in the bond would have allowed us to do that. Other other options do exist, and we'll explore that too. I would also add uh, the ongoing maintenance items that we have. We have a maintenance budget, certainly, um, every year. It's, it's barely adequate or not adequate to keep pace with uh, the <coughs> aging of our buildings from two years old to 104 years old. Um, average age of about 52 years so there's there's always going to be maintenance issues out there um, we will if something breaks we are going to fix it we, we have to find those dollars in out of reserves or out of the current uh, operating budget that we have so I would say that's another key component of this that uh, will just have to be um, evaluated on, on an ongoing basis of a personal privilege, if I may. Of course. Madam President. While you're thinking, we have something for you. This is a plaque that we have that <laughs> Thank you for the moment. Hopefully that wasn't part of my time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we always pass you for time. <laughs> yeah. When I was uh, offered this position, Dr. Shear, and I, I carry my own. Every well, I saw that, but it looked to me like it was a napkin. <laughs> it is, but it still works. <laughs> when uh, Dr. Shear offered me this position, and I started on March 23, 2015, <coughs> I was uh, I accepted the job gladly, um, excited. What I didn't know was the second family that I was getting with that acceptance.
we spent a lot of time with each other and others that aren't here along the way. And I was posed a question this evening. If you know now what you knew then, would you ever have accepted this job? And I said, undoubtedly, yes. Um, we've put in a lot of time, a lot of efforts together. We've accomplished a lot of great things, and we've had disappointments along the way. Otherwise known as life. I appreciate all the efforts that the board has made and your commitment to the community, most importantly to the students um, of the Thompson School District. Hopefully I've contributed to that somewhere along the way, in some manner. You've heard me talk uh, several times when I close a presentation of be bright, be brief, be gone. Right, debatable, brief, never, <laughs> gone, yes. Quoting Robert Frost, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. My miles just got a little bit shorter. So um, my apologies for job left undone, but my appreciation for allowing me to try. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice recognition. I certainly do appreciate it. Thank you. We will miss you. We will miss you. Like Very much so. Dr. Schaefer and I are meeting next Wednesday morning, I think it is, to 